Hi, I'm John Doherty. During this video, I want to talk about some new methods of generating non-stationary random parameter fields that I think have the potential to change some of the way we do things in decision support groundwater modeling. But before talking about generation of non-stationary random parameter fields, let's just do a little bit of revision about stationary parameter fields. So consider this as the domain of a model or the domain of a study area. And the contents of this domain are populated with a random distribution of a hydraulic property. For example, hydraulic conductivity. Now when we generate random realizations of hydraulic properties, we normally assume that there is a degree of correlation between properties that are fairly close together in space. That is, we assume that the subsurface isn't completely chaotic and that the hydraulic property at one location is somewhat similar to the hydraulic property next to it and less similar further away and less similar further away. So fundamental to the idea of random hydraulic property field generation is the idea of spatial correlation. So we'll look at this in the next few minutes. Let's subdivide this domain of study, our study domain, into using a grid. And this can be a model grid, for example. And our task in generating a hydraulic property field to fill this model domain is to assign a value of K, I'm going to call it the hydraulic property, hydraulic conductivity, to each cell in this model domain, K1, K2, right up to Kn, where n is the number of cells in the model domain. So my task is to create a giant random vector, K, with a random realization of hydraulic conductivity or a hydraulic property. And as we just said a moment ago, generation of that hydraulic property field will embody the notion of spatial correlation. Now I have to have a descriptor for the spatial correlation and because I've got a vector k here that's going to be embodied in a covariance matrix ck. So this covariance matrix which I'm actually going to build or just build notionally if not actually this covariance matrix is going to be large if I've got n cells in this model domain, I've got n elements in this vector k, I've got an n by n covariance matrix. And covariance matrix pertaining to parameters are used in a lot of things in decision support groundwater modeling. They're used for example for purposes of regularization and stochastic field generation which is the current topic that we're talking about right now. But anyway, if the vector k is large, ck, the covariance matrix of k, is going to be really large. If k has n elements, ck will have n by n elements. So we've got to figure out a simplifying way of generating the elements of this matrix. And that's what we'll look at now. What simplifications can we use to rapidly populate this n by n covariance matrix? The first simplification we can use is to assume that spatial correlation can be described by an analytical function that decays with distance. If we can describe spatial correlation using a function Notionally, it becomes an easy matter to populate the elements of the n by n covariance matrix. The second simplifying assumption is that this analytical function is the same all throughout the model domain. This is the assumption of stationarity, that whatever function I use to describe the decay of correlation with distance applies all through the model domain. 
Now normally when we're talking about geostatistics and this is the original geostatistics we normally talk about a variogram rather than covariance or correlation. Well as we'll say in a minute, show in a minute, they're really the same thing. But let's just discuss the notion of a variogram or actually the proper term is semi-variogram just for a moment. A variogram is often denoted by this symbol gamma. And if we've got two points, I and J, then the semi-variogram is the expected value of the difference between the hydraulic properties at these two points. Squared. The semi-variogram is the expected value of the difference between the hydraulic properties at these two points squared. By assuming stationarity, we're assuming that gamma is a function of h, where h is the distance between these two points. Now, it can also be a function of direction. We'll talk about that shortly. But basically, we're assuming that the expected value of the difference between hydraulic properties at two points anywhere with this entire, within this entire domain is a function only of the distance between the two points and hence can be characterized gamma h. Gamma is a function only of how far any two points are apart. We're assuming, of course, that this function does not vary throughout the model domain. So how do we derive a semi-variogram? How do we come up with a semi-variogram for our particular study area? We can guess it. In some cases, we may have measurements of hydraulic properties spread throughout the domain that we're interested in. In that case, I can group differences together on the basis of distance similarity and empirically try to come up with how the dis difference of property squared is a function of separation of the points to which the properties are assigned. And I may then be able to fit a curve through these empirical differences squared. And then I've derived my variogram for this area. Now, a variogram is often summarized by two descriptors, the range and the sill. The sill is the innate variability of the hydraulic property. The range is the distance over which there is statistical interrelatedness between one hydraulic property at one location and that at another. Now, it's fairly easy to show that the covariance between hydraulic properties at two points is simply this variogram curve turned upside down and placed in the manner shown in this figure. So if we know the variogram we can immediately derive a function that describes the dependence of the covariance of hydraulic properties on distance between the points to which those hydraulic properties are assigned. So Knowing the variogram, it's easy to derive the function that describes space as covariance as a function of distance. And once we have that, we can populate our covariance matrix. Now, we can't just use any function to describe decay of covariance or decay of correlation as a function of distance between points. In the end, if this is going to allow us to construct a covariance matrix, this function has to lead to a covariance matrix that is positive definite. So only certain functions can be used. And many of you will be familiar with those that are commonly used, for example, exponential, Gaussian, spherical, and there are others as well. So that then is a brief revision of basic geostatistics and the concept of stationarity. So now we are going to take these concepts and we are going to start looking at 
how we can generate a stochastic field. The easiest way to generate a stochastic field and probably the way that is most commonly done is called the sequential Gaussian method. And throughout this video we're going to assume that the stochastic fields which we generate are Gaussian. Now no matter how we generate a stochastic field there's a general principle here. When we generate a stochastic field that populates every cell of a model domain and that exhibits spatial correlation in ways that we've just described, that's a complicated field. But we're going to build that field from independent random variables. In the IID stands for independent identically distributed random variables. Normally these will be normally distributed, mean of zero, standard deviation of one, and of course we can translate that to another mean and amplify that to another standard deviation. But the principle is, somehow or other, we're going to take a whole heap of independently variable normal deviates and turn that into a large vector k that has a, belongs to a normal distribution with a mean of k underscore and characterized by a covariance matrix which displays the spatial correlation that we seek. And then once we have that covariance matrix and the mean value we can generate parameter fields which exhibit this spatial correlation. Now the sequential Gaussian simulation method is particularly easy. We start off by randomly selecting a cell in this grid and generating a one-dimensional random number. We just say let's generate a random number which belongs to a Gaussian distribution. It'll have the mean that pertains to the hydraulic properties in this area It'll have a standard deviation which characterized variability of hydraulic properties in this area. Then we use Kregging to extrapolate to another point that's not too far from the original point. Now many of you probably know that when we use Kregging to do spatial interpolation, Kregging gives us two things. It gives us the expected value from a statistical point of view at another point. It also gives us the standard deviation at that point. And both of these are conditioned by the value at the first point. So Kriging does conditioning for us. Once we've Krigged to this new point we have a conditional mean, a conditional standard deviation. It's one dimensional, a single Gaussian deviate. We generate a random number and we place it in this cell of the model domain. Having done that, we repeat the process. Krieg again to a third point. Krieging gives us a mean, a standard deviation, one dimensional individual random number. With a mean and a standard deviation, we generate a random number and place it here. Then we creak to the fourth point and to the fifth point and do the same process. Each time we have a new mean conditioned on the values at the other points. We have a standard deviation conditioned by the values at the other points and we generate a new random number for this new point, etc. until we fill up the entire model domain. One of the nice things about sequential Gaussian simulation is that it's very easy to handle points at which we've actually measured the hydraulic property field. Suppose we've measured the hydraulic property field at these two points which I've marked in blue. Then these then become the two points that commence the whole sequential Gaussian simulation process. We start off with these, then we use Kriging, to a third point, randomly selected. We have the conditional mean, 
conditional standard deviation. This gives us the ability to generate a random number. We place it in this cell and next time we've got three points to Krieg from. This point here we've got a mean, standard deviation and so it goes. So the entire stochastic field is such that it respects the spatial correlation which it has to respect and it respects the fact that we've measured two values here and the random field which we generate won't actually be random at these two blue points it will be those two blue points and the surrounding points will be conditioned and they will respect spatial correlation with those two blue points and so it goes on till we fill the entirety of the model domain. So how do we do this? There's plenty of software around which will allow us to do sequential Gaussian simulation. SGEMS is very popular and very good. It can be downloaded. There's the GSLib, GS Statistical Library, which provides functions that we can all use. There are Python libraries. And if we're working with ModFlow and we're using pest utilities, the field gen utility from the pest groundwater utility suite will allow us to populate a ModFlow model grid with random numbers using the sequential Gaussian simulation method. The random numbers will be correlated. We provide the variogram, field gen, and these other libraries provide the random fields. Many realizations thereof that respect the correlation that is implied in the variogram. All right, now let's get a little bit more complicated. Let's use an alternative method for the stochastic field generation. And this method is called the moving average method. As we'll see, it's got some advantages and some disadvantages, as we'll now talk about. So to implement the moving average method we adopt the same principle that we adopted before in that we have to start out with independent random normal deviates and somehow we've got to work on them, apply an algorithm to them that produces a stochastic correlated random field that we can give to a groundwater model. So here I've got a groundwater model grid. This is an unstructured grid and we can apply the moving average method to populate unstructured grids with stochastic parameter fields that exhibit spatial correlation. Now this time I take my independent normal deviates and I provide every cell in this model domain with an independent normal deviate. That's easy. I just generate all these random numbers and fill up all those cells with a random number. And they're independently random. And then I decide on what's going to be the correlation structure. And I'm representing it in this case with a correlation ellipse. This is the correlation length in this direction. This is the correlation length in the orthogonal direction. And just to make things interesting here, I'm assuming, uh, I'm assuming that there is an isotropy. So let's focus on this point. Suppose that I want to commence the process of populating this model grid with a random hydraulic property field by giving this cell the first hydraulic property value. To do that, I undertake spatial integration of all these IIDs multiplied by a Kernel function. So these are the IIDs, the random numbers all through the model domain. And this function here is a function of distance from any point to which I want to assign a hydraulic property. It's a weighting function or a Kernel function. 
at the moment this does not vary in space I use the same function here as I use here as I use here so I sum all these IIDs multiplied by the spatially decaying Kernel function that's summation integration and after doing the weighted summation of all those IIDs I then assign a value to this model cell I repeat for another model cell repeat for another model cell repeat for every model cell until every cell in this model has been assigned a hydraulic property and it can be shown that the high that collectively those hydraulic properties give me a random parameter field that shows spatial correlation and if I do things correctly it will give me the spatial correlation that I seek so how do I come up with a kernel function that gives me the spatial correlation that I seek well firstly I could use any kernel function here it'll give me a correlated random parameter field if it's a if that I want that random field to to have a specific correlation structure then I've got to be specific about the kernel function that I use Oliver 1995 provides kernel functions that we can use to deliver hydraulic property random realizations that have certain covariant structures so if I want to end up with a with an exponential decay with distance of correlation then this is how the the kernel function that I use in the spatial integration process so the left column here we have the the, the correlation structure that pertains to the random hydraulic property field that we've just generated on the right is the kernel function that I use to generate that random hydraulic property field and here is the vital correlation length this is how I what I use to establish the length over which there is spatial correlation of hydraulic properties in the resulting random parameter field in three dimensions the formula is slightly different but once again central to them is the spatial correlation length so in principle it's not very difficult to do this an advantage of this method is it's comparatively easy to program the disadvantage is it is a little bit of numerical work this spatial integration process has to be repeated for every single cell of the model domain where I do the spatial integration over all the neighboring cells and all the independent normal variates that are assigned to those cells so it's a bit slower than sequential Gaussian simulation also it's a little bit more difficult to condition those random parameter fields based on direct measurements we have of the hydraulic properties but it's not impossible we can do it there are two distinct advantages of this method of stochastic field generation one is it's not too hard to modify this methodology so it can accommodate non-stationarity the other advantage is that this can support hierarchical history matching of random parameter fields these two advantages are matters to which we will now turn our attention let's now take what we've just learned and implement non-stationary random parameter field generation now to do non-stationary stochastic field generation we follow the same principles as we did for stationary field generation 
Our task is to populate this unstructured model grid with a random parameter field that exhibits spatial correlation but the nature of that spatial correlation can vary in space. Now suppose that uh, this unstructured model grid is built at a, at a site at which site conceptualization studies have been carried out. Now when you think about it, what, what do we as modelers expect from site conceptualization studies? We, we expect that we have the ability to build stochastic fields which reflect what a hydrogeologist thinks is the most likely characteristics of the disposition of hydraulic properties as they exist in different parts of the model domain. And recognizing that for any model domain of any size, those stochastic characteristics are going to vary in space. Suppose then that as a result of site characterization, a geologist has given us a, um, a, a, a an ellipse here with the correlation length in this direction and in this direction and that is a summary of what is expected at this point. Not only the correlation length but the expected value of the hydraulic property and also the expected variability of the hydraulic property. Now at another point perhaps geological conditions, conditions are the same. So the ellipse and the ancillary quantities will be the same. But in another place, perhaps we expect an isotropy to be in a slightly different direction because we have a different rock type or perhaps a different direction of which alluvial deposition. Perhaps the same here. Perhaps it's more isotropic over here. This geological mud map, for want of a better word, hydrogeological mud map, would be a lovely outcome of site characterization studies. Perhaps here we expect there to be some structure resulting in pronounced correlation in one direction and far less correlation in another and even more so here. Further north we're back to isotropy and here etc. So if at the end of the day a hydrogeologist can provide us with this hydrogeological mud map that allows us to know expected value of hydraulic properties and the nature of the heterogeneity that is possibly can exist at any place and at different places throughout the model domain. This is something that firstly kind of is realistic. Uh, we can expect this kind of thing and we can use this kind of thing to populate a model grid with stochastic fields which can express uncertainty but which, as we'll talk about, can also be adjusted so that while they express uncertainty can allow the model to model outputs to match historical measurements of system behavior. So let's go through the process. Firstly, we take this geological mud map and we interpolate these quantities to every cell of our unstructured model grid. That way, every cell reflects what is expected at that point. The nature of heterogeneity as expressed through correlation lengths in different directions, the expected value of hydraulic properties, the expected variability of hydraulic properties. Then, as before, we assign an IID to every cell. We just generate a whole a realization of a whole lot of random numbers. We'll do this many times. The first time we populate this model with a set of IIDs, we'll generate one stochastic field. Then we'll populate the model with another set of IIDs and using the same Kernel function, generate another stochastic field. So this whole thing repeated, repeated for each stochastic realization that we build all based on site conceptualization studies as encapsulated in this little hydrogeological mud map. So step two, assign IIDs to every cell of the model domain, random, normal, Gaussian deviates. Step three, integrate, just as we did before. But the difference here is 
is that this kernel function, this integration kernel function, is now a function of location. So the kernel function that's used to provide this cell with a hydraulic property differs from that used to provide this cell with a hydraulic property which differs from that used to provide this cell with a hydraulic property. So we still use IIDs in the background but in the foreground this integration kernel is dependent on the location to which we're assigning a hydraulic property through this spatial averaging process. So Here's the hydraulic property in any particular cell integrating over the IIDs spatially varying kernel. And for different sets of IIDs that populate this whole model domain, we get different realizations of hydraulic properties. Using the same spatially varying kernel each time, but different realizations of IIDs populating every cell of this unstructured model grid. And this is starting to look perhaps a little realistic and certainly more realistic, more usable, more reflective of spatial heterogeneity as exists in the real world than hydraulic property fields that are generated under the assumption of stationarity. And step four, if this is our intention, is to history match. These IIDs, they're random numbers. They're assigned to each cell of the model domain. And then they're used as the basis for stochastic, spatially distributed parameter field generation. But they're also adjustable. Once they've been generated, they can then be adjusted. And every time they're adjusted, this integration process is repeated. And they can be adjusted until model outputs match field measurements. So using perhaps many different realizations based on different sets of IIDs, we then have the, a, a basis for using ensemble methods in innovative ways that haven't been done before. So we can adjust each one of the set of IIDs which underlies construction of this field, the set of IIDs which underline construction of this field, just like normal use of ensemble methods but we're adjusting independent normal variates so that collectively all of these at the end of the process will not just reflect spatial heterogeneity as it exists at this particular site but will also allow model outputs to match field measurements. They can then be used to quantify the uncertainty of hydraulic properties throughout the model domain. They can then be used to quantify the uncertainties of predictions of management interests. Now there are, there are other options here as well. We can assign IIDs to every cell of the model domain, but just to make things a little bit easier and a little bit quicker, the same process based on the same concepts can be implemented if these IIDs are actually assigned to pilot points. This makes random field generation, random field manipulation a little bit quicker, but it doesn't compromise the fact that we're still using non-stationary statistics, still generating random hydraulic property fields based on those non-stationary statistics and perhaps everything's a little bit easier and quicker to adjust if we assign the IIDs which are at first random and then adjusted if we assign them to pilot points rather than individual cells of the model grid. So there's a tutorial on the GMDSI website where something similar to that has been done it's uh, built on a synthetic example which is based on a real world example where we have a river flowing down the side of a model domain and alluvial deposits grading into background uh, geology as we move away from the river. We expect 
anisotropy to exist with greater spatial correlation in the direction of river flow than perpendicular to it. That's the direction of elongation of continuity of structural properties. So our conceptual points can then reflect the fact that there's spatial correlation along the length of the river close to the river and conditions become more isotropic as we move away from the river. Meanwhile, pilot points hosted the IIDs, which can then be adjusted. Well, once they're generated, the IIDs, the random numbers are generated and assigned to the pilot points. Random hydraulic property fields can be built. And then the IIDs, the random numbers, originally random that were assigned to the pilot points, can be simultaneously adjusted using an ensemble smoother so that all these random hydraulic property fields simultaneously allow model outputs to match field data and uncertainty can be quantified. So now let's turn our attention to one of the other benefits of generating spatially correlated random parameter fields using weighted averaging. And that is what's commonly referred to as hierarchical history matching. So, as we've just said, we've assigned independent normal variates to all cells of a model grid or perhaps to pilot points. They're independently normal they have a prior probability distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And it's this integration kernel that turns them into random, to a random parameter field that we can supply to a model that has a spatial correlation structure. But the point is, it is this kernel which brings, which ushers in the spatial correlation these retain their prior probability distributions. Their prior probability distribution is they are random normal deviates, mean of zero, standard deviation of one. So when we're doing history matching using ensemble methods, we can take these random normal deviates and adjust them while respecting their prior and their prior does not change even if the kernel changes. This means that we can estimate parameters that are associated with the kernel at the same time as we are adjusting the random normal deviates. These do not change their character, they do not change their prior. So we're not violating any of the assumptions under which methodologies such as Ensemble Smoothers, PES, PP, IES works. So we can adjust these parameter fields, the IID parameter fields, but also adjust the parameters associated with these conceptual points that dictate the length of spatial correlation, the direction of spatial correlation, the background hydraulic properties. So this is starting to get very powerful. Adjusting these does not affect the prior probability distributions, the stochastic properties of these. So we can generate random parameter fields using the methods that we've talked about. We can then adjust the IIDs that form the hub of these random parameter fields at the same time as we adjust so-called hyperparameters which govern the nature of stochasticity as it varies throughout the model domain. That is we can adjust parameters that dictate where heterogeneity is at the same time as we can adjust parameters that dictate the shape of the emergent heterogeneity. And this can be done using ensembles so that we're respecting the prior probability distribution.
the fact that we don't quite know the prior probability distribution, but through the parameter adjustment process in which we're adjusting both IIDs and hyperparameters, we're also creating circumstances under which model outputs fit field measurements. Now, this is starting to get to open up wonderful new possibilities for stochastic parameterization of complex models. However, perhaps, perhaps we don't want to actually adjust parameters. It's not the only way to quantify uncertainty. There's another video which discusses data space inversion. And here we quantify predictive uncertainty and make predictions as accurately as we can using another methodology which still uses a model but which does not actually require adjustment of random parameters. Watch this video to find out more about it, but here we'll just discuss it briefly. So we generate, for example, 300 parameter fields. And using the methods that we've just talked about, these can encapsulate non-stationary parameter fields, but they can also encapsulate uncertainty of the hyperparameters. That is, they can encapsulate the fact that I'm not quite certain about the uncertainty that's encapsulated in the prior probability distribution. They can encapsulate uncertainty in uncertainty. So I can generate random parameter fields and perhaps the hyperparameters I use for this may not be the same as the one that I use for this parameter field. Thereby, I'm allowing the uncertainty analysis process to accommodate the fact that I'm not quite sure of spatial correlation lengths, directions, variances. And that then can become part of the mix through which these random samples of prior parameter fields that I give to the model are generated. So I generate 300 random parameter fields that encapsulate uncertainty and that encapsulate uncertainty in prior uncertainty. I run them through the model over the past into the future. I then, as described in the other video, build a statistical model that links what happened in the past to what will happen in the future. It is this statistical model that I then calibrate instead of the real model. It is this statistical model that I then condition by my field measurements so that when I make a prediction, I can make a prediction of minimum error variance and quantify the uncertainty of that prediction. And the uncertainties as that I associate with these predictions become somewhat more realistic when I acknowledge that I'm not quite certain of the prior parameter probability distribution and certainly I've taken into account the fact that the disposition of hydraulic properties throughout my model domain is non-stationary. Before finishing this video, let me draw your attention to a GMDSI tutorial which explores and demonstrates some of the concepts that we've just been talking about. The tutorial is based on a three-dimensional model, a synthetic model. It starts out with a set of conceptual points arranged on a three-dimensional grid. These conceptual points, as we've just talked about, embody the nature of heterogeneity as it is assumed to exist at each point. The nature of heterogeneity includes specification of the directions of the correlation ellipses both horizontally and vertically because this is a three-dimensional model. We're assuming that the model domain is characterized by 
fairly isotropic sufficial material in the shallow subsurface. Host rock, which has some degree of pervasive anisotropy. And in the middle of the model domain, there is a zone of possible structure of high hydraulic conductivity where water can flow up and down possible faults. So, at each of these conceptual points, we specify our axes of spatial correlation plus what we think is the variability of hydraulic properties at those points and the variability of hydraulic properties at those points. These are then interpolated throughout the model domain to every cell of that 20 layer three dimensional model grid. Parameterization is based on a dense array of pilot points. These are the points to which the IIDs are assigned. These IIDs, these normal variates, are then manipulated using IES and PEST-HP in ways described by the tutorial. Here's an example of a stochastic field obtained using spatial integration. And here are examples of three simulations of hydraulic conductivity within different layers of this three-dimensional model domain. The tutorial explores the uncertainty of a number of predictions using a number of different methods and compares the uncertainties and the predictions attained using those methods. It also demonstrates the use of a number of, of utility programs available through the PEST Groundwater Utility Suite which allow us to implement the methodologies which have been the subject of this video. So in conclusion, as I said at the start of this video, I think there is the potential here to do some new and exciting things that haven't been done before. The ideas actually go back a long way, but the implementation is still fairly new, especially in groundwater modeling. We have the ability to generate, well, semi-realistic, non-stationary stochastic fields, to adjust parameters associated with those fields, not just those which determine where heterogeneity exists, or can exist, but also parameters which govern the shape of that heterogeneity. At the same time, both sets of parameters can be generated and adjusted through a complex history matching process using hierarchical history matching. Or, if we don't want to actually adjust parameters, we can use the methodologies which we've been talking about in this, in this video to provide a very solid foundation for making predictions and quantifying their uncertainty using data space inversion. And that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching.